Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars by Daniel Pinkwater. Chapters 21 and 22. Chapter 21. On Sunday evening, the course got interesting. It got interesting when Alan Mendelssohn was taking his turn reading to me. He had just gotten through a long passage about how the custom of eating chopped liver is not of earthly origin, but was picked up from interplanetary travelers by the residents of Atlantis. I must say the book was past the point of being boring and had become totally ridiculous. Mendelssohn and I laughed so much that we couldn't laugh anymore. We just read on, reading the book, because somehow we had made an unspoken pact to read our way through to the very end. Mendelssohn had gotten through the part about chopped liver. Now he was into a section of Lemurian prophecies. It seems the Lemurian wise men had predicted the civil war, the airplane, the automobile, sliced bread, frisbees, and the Hong Kong flu. So what? Anybody can say he predicted anything. I could say that I predicted that men would go to the moon, unless I had some proof that I said it a long time before anybody went there or looked like they'd go there. It wouldn't mean a thing. Then Alan Mendelssohn got to the interesting part. Also, he read, the Lemurian sages predicted that one day accounts of their deeds would be read by two boys named Alan Mendelssohn and Leonard Nebel. I thought he was just fooling around, making it up. His surprised expression and sort of sputtering, pointing, poking at the book, I took to be acting. Good acting, but not real. How could it be real? How could our names be in the book? Alan showed me. In the same smudgy little mimeograph typing, there they were our names. How was this possible? Was it some trick of Samuel Klugarsh? We didn't put anything past him, but how would he have done it? Samuel Klugarsh didn't know we were coming. We had run into him at the Bermuda Triangle Chili Parlor. He hadn't been out of our sight the whole time we'd been with him. In order to insert our names, he would have had to type the whole page on a mimeograph stencil and then run it off and insert it in the book. Alan Mendelssohn had worked on the school newspaper in the Bronx and had used a mimeograph machine. He said it would have taken at least 15 minutes if Samuel Klugarsh was a fast typist and mimeographist. Of course, if Samuel Klugarsh had known in some way that we would be coming back, he could have prepared the hyperstellar archaeology course with our names in it. But how could he know we'd be back in only a couple of days? And how could he know that we would want to trade in our Klugarsh mind control course in Omega Meter? What's more, neither of us could remember having told Samuel Klugarsh our names. He usually just called us gentlemen. If there was a trick in it somehow, somewhere, we couldn't figure it out. Of course, if it wasn't a trick, at least not a trick of Samuel Klugarsh, if it was a trick of the ancient Lemurian sages... Then it put the whole book in a different light. Then it meant that all the stuff about the origins of eating chopped liver and packaged chocolate pudding being a deadly explosive with one ingredient missing and super intelligent chickens, it might all be true. We had been making jokes and playing a dumb game with a book that might be true. Right after the book mentioned our names, it went on to something totally unrelated, which seemed to be the style of the thing. It went on to talk about how rubber automobile tires are actually living beings and have feelings and memories and personalities. When they got flat, it means they're dead. We were confused. First, the book had gone on and on with all sorts of weird, unproven statements, one after another, with no rhyme or reason. Then it mentioned us both by name. Then it went back to strange little snippets of information. Yojimbo's Japanese English Dictionary was compiled by Clarence Yojimbo, a beloved Japanese scholar, who was actually a beloved Venusian scholar in disguise. Since Venusians live upward of 3,000 years, Clarence Yojimbo had the opportunity to reside both in Lemuria in its golden age 
and much later in Japan during the late Takugawa period. Yojimbo compiled a much respected Japanese English dictionary for the use of merchants doing business in Yokohama. What is singular about the dictionary is that when read backwards, noting only the second word in English in each entry, it is found to contain another book, a key to ancient Lemurian mind control methods, rediscovered briefly and then lost again by the Order of the Laughing Alligator, of which Yojimbo was a member. We got the Japanese English dictionary out of the red manila folder. We turned to the last entry, Zuzushi, impudent, audacious, bold, cheeky, saucy, unblushing, shameless, brazen-faced, lost to a sense of shame. So the second word in English was audacious. The next to last entry in the dictionary was Zuzuki, meaning pushing one's opponent on the chest with one's head. The second word in English was ones, but it was misprinted with no apostrophe. So far we had audacious ones. We went up the page writing down the second English word in each entry. Soon it began to make a sentence. Then two, audacious ones push straight to the center. In order to advance mental power, show caution and courage, daring and patience. It made sense. We didn't understand it, but it made sense. We read on. Alan Mendelssohn read aloud, reading the second word in English from each entry, going from the back of the book to the front. It made a sentence all right, but they were very hard to understand. Obscure, Alan Mendelssohn said. A short song effortless. A single monorail charged with coal syrup. The metal worker steel prospect imparts a candid lump of airworthiness to the short dandelion. Mark a post, an object with wood, screws of tacit approval. Aim silent mental wooden drum at Buddhist temple. Win, lose by ten crosses. Profit net proceeds of one thousand yen. Turn a book upside down. Most of the sentences seemed to us to be saying something, but we couldn't figure out what. Sometimes it was a little easier. To send thoughts mentally without speaking directly by special means telegraphically radio telegraphy, it is best to use made of metal an antenna, a fence, a gate, a sword, a thing, silver, copper, steel, to receive same similar procedure good. That seemed to us to be fairly clear. It was saying that to send or receive thoughts like radio waves, you need an antenna. We went through the dictionary slowly, backwards, writing down a word at a time and puzzling over the groups of words, trying to see them as sentences. It was slow work. We hadn't covered very much of the dictionary by the time Alan's mother called on the telephone and said for him to come home at once. Alan asked me if I'd mind if he took the dictionary home with him. He said he would stay up late and copy out some more stuff and maybe recopy the parts that made sense into a notebook. I told him to go ahead. We'd talk more about it in school the next day. Chapter 22 at school the next day, Alan Mendelssohn had a notebook with a bunch of words copied backwards out of Yojimbo's Japanese-English dictionary in it. He hadn't had the time to organize them into sentences. He just copied as many as he could before going to sleep. We met before school to discuss our mind control program for the day. I had a metal ruler. We tried it out as an antenna. There was some debate at first as to where it would be best to put the antenna. Alan Mendelssohn thought it would work best if it were attached to the head in some way, held in the teeth or balanced on top of the head, or maybe just scotch taped to the head. I thought it would work best if it was handheld and maybe pointed at the subject. We tried it my way. It worked. 
Soon, just about every kid in the schoolyard had been zapped with a mental command. One by one, they removed their hats, if any, and rubbed their bellies, and in some cases, danced. All I had to do was point at the kid in question with the ruler, think my command, and off they'd go, uncapping, rubbing, and dancing. Alan Mendelssohn and I were delighted. Yojimbo's Japanese English dictionary was definitely a source of good advice. We had enough time before the bell to try to figure out some more sentences from Alan Mendelssohn's notebook. He had copied the words in neat columns on the left-hand side of each page. He had about 10 pages of words. We went down the column, pointing with a pencil, cost, expenditure, outlay, employment, casual, hired, in the air. We included parenthetical expressions as one word. Brown-eared chicken rich lover's conditions, petition the emperor, conceal pyramid mark object thus, decide upon a matter, hand a definite answer, interesting framework construction, be imposing in appearance. None of this made any sense to us. To us. It was too obscure, as Alan Mendelssohn liked to say. Then we came to some clearer parts. Best way get results. Have mental picture, illustration, sketch, example, before requesting order to send, to transmit, to give an order. Execute an order. Do one's bidding. First see it, then send it. We thought that over. I pointed the ruler at a kid, closed my eyes, and tried to see the kid walking with his arms stretched out to the sides, putting one foot directly in front of the other, sort of waving his arms up and down, first one, then the other. A picture of a kid walking a tightrope. I gave the mental command. I opened my eyes. The kid was doing a perfect imitation of a tightrope walker. It was beautiful. Alan Mendelssohn wanted to try it. He had something special in mind. He picked out a kid, pointed the ruler at him, and closed his eyes. He opened his eyes. The kid stepped on his own foot, made circles in the air with his arms, and collapsed forward in a shower of school books, pencils, blue-lined three-hole notebook paper, and the contents of his lunch bag. This is it, Alan Mendelssohn said. The ultimate trip. The remote control trip. This is the culmination of my career as a tripper. This will be my masterpiece. Leonard, let me borrow the metal ruler until lunchtime. There was still time before the bell rang to start school. I told Alan, sure, he could borrow the ruler. The bell rang and we went to our classes. I wondered what it would be like coming back to school after all those days off. It wasn't like anything. Nobody paid any special attention to me. It was evident that nobody had noticed I hadn't been there. The next bell rang. Take your seats and get ready for the PA announcements, Miss Steele said. I unscrewed the top of my ballpoint pen and took out the little brass refill. I pointed it at Miss Steele. I closed my eyes and got hold of a mental picture. Then I gave the command and opened my eyes. Miss Steele was looking uncomfortable. I had picked a pretty tricky mental picture, but apparently it worked. I had imagined a smoker going crazy for a cigarette. I had seen Miss Steele lighting up outside the building on the way to her car, and I figured she had a pretty serious habit. She was starting to sweat. Finally, she said, I'll be gone for just a moment. Robert Robinson, will you please take charge of the class while I'm gone? She left. I made a mental note to quit fooling with cigars before I got hooked. Robert Robinson was perhaps the most obnoxious kid in the school. He was big and had muscles and wavy hair and no pimples and was handsome in a sort of simpy way. He spent all his time looking at the backs of his hands or combing his hair or making his muscles twitch. He was Mr. Jerris's favorite kid. He could climb those ropes just like a cockroach. I pointed the ballpoint pen refill at him. It was working out just fine as a sort of short-range antenna. 
I worked up a better mental image for Robert Robinson than I had for Miss Steele. It was someone who has to go to the bathroom but can't leave the place he's assigned to stay. This was perfect for Robinson. Ordinarily, he would be clowning and sort of looking handsome for the girls and doing cool things like putting one foot in front of the, um, in, on the front desk in a row and sort of leaning forward and twitching his muscles. Now he had to concentrate on not wetting his pants, and that made it impossible to be funny or act cool or crack jokes or do much of anything but shift from foot to foot and try unsuccessfully to look casual while, while doing it. I had seen a detective program on television in which the crime had been solved on the basis of the fact that the detective knew that it takes seven and a half minutes to smoke a cigarette. Miss Steele was not going to come back without smoking her cigarette all the way down. The class was going wild, and Robert Robinson had nothing to do but rock from foot to foot and try to hold on. He was too dumb to simply walk out of the classroom, go to the bathroom, and come back in the hope that Miss Steele wouldn't have come back before him. Even if she had, he could have just told her that he had an emergency, or if he was too shy to say that, he could say he went out to look for her or anything, but he was too dumb. She told him to stay, and he stayed, like a trained dog. The P.A. started up. Mr. Winter said, Good morning. When the surf's up in old California, there's just old paint and me, just a boy and his horse on a surfboard, where the wind and the waves are free. Surfing, surfing, surfing with my horse. Surfing, surfing, surfing with my horse. Do wa, do wa. He was singing. This was obviously Alan Mendelssohn's work. I waited until Mr. Winter finished his song. He was sort of sputtering around, trying to make sense out of what he had just done. I pointed my ballpoint refill at the loudspeaker. I made a mental image of a sound. That was obviously how Mendelssohn had done it. I will now give the correct time, Mr. Winter said. Cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. Cuckoo! 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 The whole school was laughing. This didn't make things any easier for Robert Robinson. There was a loud click. Mr. Winter had switched off the PA. Miss Steele came back into the room. Robert, Robert Robinson ran out without a word as soon as he saw her. It took her until the bell rang to get things quieted down. At lunchtime, Alan Mendelssohn and I met for a discussion of strategy. We agreed to cool it for the rest of the day. We had done so much mind controlling that we were getting dizzy. Also, we didn't want to create a full-scale riot like the time Alan had told everyone that he was a Martian. Between the opening bell of the day and the start of lunch period, we had caused people to be rooted to the spot, bark like dogs, have uncontrollable urges to do various things they simply couldn't do with people watching. We had done a lot of tripping and a good deal of making people think that a notebook or a pencil weighed a hundred pounds. The whole school was like a circus, and we were the audience. But it wasn't as much fun as we thought it would be. For one thing, part of the fun of the circus is the big crowd of people you're watching it with. That's why circuses are no good on television. With only Alan and me in on the joke, it wasn't all that entertaining to get people to do funny things. Also, those kids who weren't too stupid to realize that something strange was going on were getting scared. A couple of kids had even cried when Mr. Winter was cuckooing. People get scared when they think other people are going crazy. We had decided to cool it. We wouldn't do any more tricks on the people that day, and we would plan something really big for our new power. There was another sentence Alan Mendelssohn had found in the dictionary the night before. To control minds of other people is good trick, but to control objects is great trick. Can a stone fly? We picked up a small pebble and went to work on it. It didn't budge. We tried again and got it to move so slightly that we couldn't be sure it had moved. 
It took us the rest of the lunch period to move it an inch. So ends chapter 22, Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars.